Hey everybody, this is Jennifer from The Shooter's Mindset. We are live with episode 339. That is crazy that we've done 339 of these. Every time I say it, I'm like, wow, that's a lot of fun. Um, it's been going for what, seven years? Wow, I've been doing this six or seven years. Yeah, crazy. And Anthony right. was doing it before that. So you're getting old. Um, anyway, that smart aleck would be our co host, Greg Cannon. How's it going? It is going fantastic. Just another day in my 30s. Glad you might not get out of your 30s. And Paul McCoy is our other co host. How's it going tonight, Paul? Good. I am, uh, for the first time in my career, going to have air conditioning in the area where I turn barrels. So that's coming in uh, next week. So wow, that's uh, impressive. Be my that's first impressive. air conditioned shop in nearly 10 years. That's impressive with being located in the Southeast that you haven't had air conditioning. I'm old, but I'm tough. So. Well, there you go. And our guest of the hour, Ashley Lubinsky, how's it going? Oh, it's going pretty good. Uh, we were sharing temperature earlier, and I'm in Phoenix, so it's 115. But I have air conditioning. <laughs> she had us beat, though, with 115. A little less humid, but pretty warm, pretty toasty. So a little bit. I was super excited for this show because I, you know, was here whenever we did the show with you the first time when you were um, at the Cody Firearms Museum and. Loved that show, had a blast. Every time I get a shot show and interview you, we have a blast. Um, and my daughter is into all things historic. So she just loves your Instagram and everything and <laughs> meals and all that, you know. She um, reminds me a lot of you, you know, petite and likes to dress up, but likes historic stuff. So uh, I was looking forward to this show big time. But for anybody that maybe is not familiar with you, tell us a little bit about how you got into the firearms industry. So I always like to start with the fact that I don't really feel like I'm a part of the firearms industry. I always say I'm tangential, you know, because I, I work a lot in the museum field. I work a lot with, you know, manufacturers, but I kind of come and go. Um, but I am a firearms historian and I got my master's degree from the University of Delaware, actually studying armed feminism and leftist firearms activism from the 1960s to the 1980s. And when I was in graduate school, I worked at the Smithsonian Institution's National Firearms Collection and then ended up going to Cody um, on and off because they're a Smithsonian affiliate. And so I just got a lot of exposure to major big old gun collections at different institutions. And so I started studying up as much as I could about kind of everything about gun history. I mean, I guess I, I always tell people and I, I know a little bit about a lot because it's been my job to kind of go from the 1400s all the way up through modern day. So I've been fortunate to be able to work in collections that uh, have afforded me that opportunity. But I started with the history. I started doing practical application with the guns. I learned how to shoot modern and historic firearms. I think I've now probably shot most historic firearm types. I got to shoot a hand cannon about a year or two ago which was awesome. And um, outside of that, I started a consulting business while I was in Cody and I work for museums that have gun collections. I work for, as an expert witness for a lot of different places and consultant for nonprofits and basically anything firearms and gun history related, I do that. That's awesome. So Greg's still sharing. So for um, the last time that we talked, you were at the Cody Firearms Museum. Correct. And we talked about all of that. I think you were, there was a brand new museum coming up that you helped to kind of design and get on the ground. And that was really cool to see that come to fruition. And then maybe a year after it is when you left, I think. Yeah, so, so we reopened the museum in July 2019, and I always, that was my baby. I always say I gave my 20s to the Cody Farms Museum. I was the project director on it, and um, I got a great team that I, you know, that I worked with, and we, re we opened the museum, or I guess reopened the museum 2019, and then I, I stayed 
for a year because I wanted to make sure that we closed out the budget and that there weren't any major, you know, issues with the museum. So people were like, man, she, you know, messed that up and, and then ran away. So I, I hung around for that. And then I've spent the past year still involved with the museum, helping with the transition because my assistant is now the curator, Danny. And so I just kind of was helping everything balance out and help him, you know, with some of the bigger projects we did because they've been in a hiring freeze because of COVID. So I'm still involved, but just not as actively. I don't have to run the day to day, which is awesome. So I get to do what I want to do when it comes to the museum. That's pretty cool. You can kind of, do you still get to like design the um, displays and all? Um, for Cody, not so much. They've been pretty much the way they've been since we re reopened, and that was because of COVID. Uh, but Danny actually just got to curate his first ex exhibition all on his own um, in our temporary gallery. We have a temporary gallery back at the museum that was meant for rotation, but obviously COVID had other plans. And so he was able to, I think it's open now, um, and it's on a historic provenance. And I know that sounds pretty boring if you don't know about the history field but basically what he did was he took the firearms from the collection and was able to tie them to either marketing and advertisements or you know first person references in like the winchester records to talk about the fact that without you know having all of the archival material proof evidence for the firearm the artifact in and of itself can be pretty worthless that's pretty cool yeah so go check that out if you're going to Cody. They are fully open, uh, no masks required, and Cody completely is back to normal. I still want to go. Sometime I'm going to get up to Cody. I'd love to see the area anyway, and I definitely want to go and see the museum at some point. Well, I think it's pretty great, but I'm biased. <laughs> Just a little bit biased. Just a little bit biased. Hey, the Wall Street Journal and NPR liked it, and I think that if you can get an approval from them, that's pretty good. That's pretty good, actually, since it's firearms related. But yeah, you know, it's not like saying like, oh yeah, Recoil Magazine liked it. I mean, of course they did, but I also write for them, so again, but, bias. I mean, it's cool for them to like it, but for someone outside of the gun industry to like it, that's, that's yeah. Cool. It was really interesting because it was really hard to get any major mainstream publication to cover it. Um, but yeah, Wall Street Journal, the person who was reviewing the museum had reviewed a couple of the other museums in the larger organization that the Firearms Museum is a part of. And so, and he actually took some shots at the Firearms Museum. I did not intend that pun, but there it is, um, in an article reviewing one of our other museums. And so it was really cool to have him come back because I was like super nervous because I knew we didn't like the museum. And the like second he walked in the museum, we had part of it was open to the public and, you know, the rest of it was being renovated. And I remember he looked around and he goes, oh my gosh, people are talking <laughs> because he felt like it was such a you know, it was such a, a sanctuary almost when it was before it was just guns and nobody was talking and there weren't, you know, there weren't a ton of families in there. Um, and so he was like, there's actually people talking and like a different demographic in here. So I was like, <laughs> right when he came, but yeah, he had not liked the museum in the past. So it was cool to see that he had changed his opinion. So you were telling me earlier that your husband also works in the farms industry. What, uh, what all do you guys do uh, as far as what he does? Yeah, so he's president of sales for Ammo Inc., which uh, does a lot of different things that <laughs> I don't, I never know what I can say and what I can't say because it's a publicly traded company. Um, but it, before Ammo Inc. really got kind of its start, it was known for the Streak ammunition product line, which was the one way photoluminescent. It's kind of like a glow ring. Uh, you know, you shoot it and then it heats up the back of the bullet so you can see it, but the person can't see it coming. So it's, it's really cool. I was able to go down to Machine Gun America and shoot a Sterling, which is what the, uh, uh, stormtroopers uh, use in Star Wars with the street ammo. So I felt real badass about it. Um, but the company's grown a lot over the years and they just bought Gun Broker. So they're doing really well. And he's also a professional three gun shooter. Um, and he, I just brought him on as a consultant in my consulting business, although he hasn't consulted yet. I don't think maybe I should listen more. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, we should all listen more. <laughs> so your consulting company is called The Gun Code. 
Yeah. It's gotten a lot of press recently, which is really funny because it's just a single member LLC that I thought was a cool name that I started in Wyoming and now I have it in Arizona. And uh, when I testified in front of the Senate, they like read the name of it. And I was like, oh my God, I should probably make this a real thing because I've just used it as the name, you know, the kind of umbrella that I, you know, under which I do my consulting, but it really wasn't anything. And now I feel like I need swag or something because it's getting so much press. That's pretty cool though. So what all services do y'all offer? Yeah, so a lot of different things. It's very fluid uh, in my world. So I'm doing the, obviously the history side of the house and my husband's starting to get into industry consulting, but uh, basically for the past five or so years, I've done uh, museum She froze. She got up. hot. Got too hot. That's the right. Internet, the That's internet that, burned up. That Arizona heat. She'll go out and uh, come back in in just a second. There she is. You guys totally disappeared. That was new. <laughs> Where'd I lose you? Um, pretty much you said like two words and then froze and kind of looked like you were doing the thriller. And cool. I mean, if I was going to freeze, it should be like that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then that was it. So oh, yeah. So the gun code. So in the history side of the house, I started off with museum consulting only. I uh, worked for a lot of museums around the country. Basically, if you have a gun collection, they end up calling me because there's very few people in the country that are trained in both museums and firearms. So I've been working with that. And then I've also started doing expert witness testimony. I've worked on civil cases like product liability of historic firearms that people get secondhand at pawn shops. I worked on a criminal case for the Crown, uh, the government of Canada. I like to say I helped put a murderer behind bars and theoretically I did, but my part was the most mundane uh, of the all of the testimonies. I just dated the rounds of ammunition that were used 1917 and 1945 respectively, uh, <laughs> which is really random, I know. And uh, so I've been doing that. And then now I'm the adjunct scholar of firearms history, technology and culture for the firearms policy coalition. So I've been doing consulting with them as well as working as an expert on some of their cases and TV. I you know produce gun shows. I produce history shows. I've been on history shows and I recently helped cast a show uh, for Vice Media. So I've been doing a lot. If it's gun and history related, I have some hand in it through my consulting business. That's really awesome because I would like to see movies have more realistic firearms. I, mean, I can't make promises on that. <laughs> I would like to see firearms have more magazines like in the movies. Oh, <laughs> I was going to say, I mean, like there's lots of magazines, but <laughs> you're right. In the movies, it's often not very believable. I want one of those 96 round high capacity assault clips that fits inside of the frame of the Glock 19 like they have in the movies. I mean, I feel like you just got to invent it. I, I, I am an engineer. I need to just figure out how to do it <laughs> and then expand them. So in all of this consulting work that you've done, what would you say would be the most interesting consulting work you've ever done? Oh, that's a difficult question. <laughs> <laughs> most interesting consulting work I've done. So it's gonna sound like the most boring, but it's actually, I think the most interesting is I have worked on, and this is all public information. You can pull up my testimony and my deposition, all that stuff. Uh, it's public record, but I worked on the cold type single actions that Ruger uh, sold from 1953 to, or 1955 through 1973, um, because they were made in the fashion of original cold single actions. Um, and so in order to fire them, you had to load five rounds rather than the six rounds and you had an empty round um, and the hammer down on that. And that was because uh, the way that the primer was sitting and the firing pin on 
the Ruger is a little bit different than the original Colt, but basically if the hammer was all the way down on a primer, if you dropped it in a certain fashion, it could fire. And so there were a lot of accidental discharges that happened with Colts and all different kinds of stuff. But um, I worked on those cases because uh, Ruger actually invented a lot of the first real uh, Colt type single action safeties in the 1960s as a reaction to the Gun Control Act. He thought that even though it was only placed on import restrictions, he was worried it would happen in the U.S. So he developed these, you know, safeties that had never been done before in that type of firearm, discontinued the old model line and started uh, making what's called the new model, which has a transfer bar safety, which is basically exactly how it sounds. So the hammer hits a transfer bar, which hits the firing pin, which fires the gun. So I think it's interesting because I had no idea the complexity of the history of safeties and then also the technical component of it and then why old safeties that were around at the time of the cold type single action couldn't be applied to that gun. And I don't know if I'm doing a good job of explaining why it's interesting, but I swear <laughs> it's a really cool history because you've got, you know, the, the kind of intersection of technology, product liability, marketing, uh, you know, people who can't read safety manuals because it's always been in their safety manual, how to, how to handle it and how to properly use it. So I've always found that to be really interesting. And then really any expert case, ends up being fascinating, but that one I thought was really cool. Yeah. Craig has a question. Has anybody here ever read the safety manual that came with a firearm? I don't think anybody should answer that question. <laughs> Speaking as someone that sits on the other side of the table, I don't think you should answer that question on a recording in a live stream. Live stream. <laughs> She's been in far more courtrooms than me, so I'm going to just, yeah. Um, anyway, so uh, next question. <laughs> but no, that, that does sound really cool. Like, I, I think that it's super awesome. Um, you know, in the car world, something like that, you know, they, they use the term resto mod a lot where, you know, you take something that's old school, cool, but you put some of the modern things into it so that you still have that, that old, old flavor and that old smell combined with, you know, modern features and conveniences. Um, <clears throat> a, a very good friend of mine just recently started working for a company called Vintage Bronco and they go and they buy a, a, a VIN label off of an old Bronco. And then they put all new parts around that label and it looks just like an old Bronco, but instead of like cranking the window like this, you know, you push down on the top of the, the crank and the windows go down. Um, so it's, it's always something cool to see something kind of old that's modernized and rejuvenated and, you know, it's like what it could have been back, back then. Well, and that's actually a really fascinating part of history. And I think with your daughter with the historic preservation, she probably knows about this as well, which is that- Clarification, be... clarification. Greg does not have a daughter. Jennifer has a daughter. Oh, yeah. Jennifer, sorry, sorry, sorry. I was pointing down <laughs> at where she was in the square, yeah. Um, but the that can be kind of controversial in the historic field because you make the call to keep it original. Um, so even though it may you know deteriorate over time, it's the original configuration, which is what a lot of collectors want. But then you get like the car world, which I know nothing about, just putting that out there. But you know, a lot of people want that to run and some and some gun collectors do want their firearms to be more operable that they're collecting. Um, and so it, it's kind of this yin and yang relationship because it's cool because it's what the you know artifact could be now or what it looked like then, but then it also ultimately takes away from the original, you know, the original historicity. So here's a good academic term of it. And so it's, that's a, that always been a funny world that I've seen and seeing cars get restored and being like, well, if we did that in the museum world, we'd be in a lot of trouble. Yeah, I deal with that a lot. I do a lot of uh, Marine Corps replica sniper rifles. And a lot of the guys want them absolutely the way that the Marine Corps had them, even though some of the things may not have been really the way you would want them. And other guys, I've got one sitting out there. It's got a, an impact action and a, you know, I mean, it's, it's a 6.5 Creedmoor. It's not a 308. So, you know, you get all the, you know, there's a market for, there's a market for a lot of different things. I have a question. So are there, I, I guess the average person, even, even in the shooting industry, we don't hear about a lot of lawsuits, but clearly there are a lot of lawsuits that really people don't hear about. I mean, is that, are you, are you surprised at the number of lawsuits there are, you know, relating to firearms? Am I surprised at the number of lawsuits that exist in general? No. 
Um, there are a lot of lawsuits and you're right. When you think about it, uh, you do hear the, the higher, you know, the more right. higher profile. So obviously you hear about the second amendment, uh, lawsuits that are going on all the time right now, uh, which I do work on as well. But then in terms of, I guess, in terms of the firearms industry, I, feel, I don't know, I guess I always thought people did hear about some of the bigger, um, product right. issues, but, but a lot of times too, they kind of, there's a, maybe a couple of lawsuits and then they issue a recall um, so that they can prevent future lawsuits. It just depends on the situation. Sometimes recalls are needed, sometimes they're not. Um, and so I'm not surprised because people, this is a litigious society, so people like to sue for anything. Uh, there's a really great book about uh, risk culture. It's an academic history book, but kind of the evolution of, you know, adding safety warnings to things and then how you word that and how that changes over time. And then ultimately impacts kind of the lawsuit world and how companies try to preempt all of that by, you know, doing X, Y, Z and having their attorneys look at all of that. But I mean, people are going to sue even if they don't have a case. Um, I think the most fascinating thing that I've seen, not on necessarily the cases I've worked on, but in general, which is, you know, the, this is actually lawsuits in general, which is that, you know, a lot of times, you know, someone can be 100% in the right, but it costs less to settle. And that I think was like, I see that a lot on other cases and I'm like, that's sad because, you know, especially if the person doesn't have merit in the case for them to get anything, but I guess it is a cost benefit analysis. Absolutely. That, that goes on, that goes on in all things. I had a buddy that owned a car wash and the short version of the story is a guy said he broke his leg because he walked in the car wash and the, the drain cover wasn't there and it was impossible. I mean, the story he was telling was impossible. He did have a broken leg, but they settled. They paid him $250,000, so he'd have to go to court. Uh, so it's, yeah. and this same guy had gotten 35000 out of McDonald's six years earlier or something. So there's yes. a lot of that out there, and it's, it's, it's a sad thing to see but, uh, the world we live in. I mean, I guess it's good business for me, but. People put Gorilla Glue in their hair and then sue Gorilla Glue, so. <laughs> Yeah, um, I don't know. I still, Paul talking about falling into a drain. Like I remember, I was in elementary school, and my dad was the smart individual to walk around behind his truck and not notice a manhole cover open and fell down and then broke his arm. Was out of work for like two weeks. The only thing I, I don't remember two hundred and fifty thousand dollars, but I do remember that my dad was home and walked me to the bus stop every morning. So that was kind of cool. I got to hang out with my dad more. <laughs> Crazy. I was about to ask you if we had any lives. Um, I am trying to figure this out because for those of you that don't know, apparently Facebook Live changed. Um, oh, did it? Yeah, I'm trying to find where the comments are. I see two. Oh, there we go. And I apologize that my internet keeps crapping out. I said before this, I said I either will have internet that's amazing or I will disappear periodically. So just fill me in on where I disappeared and I will... Uh... <laughs> So we, we have had guests on this show from Fanger, Tennessee. Your internet is amazing. Oh, <laughs> I am me so frustrated though, because it's so, I'm on, I'm now on my, I'm now on your live stream. <laughs> um, you know, it's just so up in the air, whatever day it is. Some days it's good, some days not. Maybe I need a new <laughs> router. Hit the, you got lives? Yeah, uh, Paul, Matt Partain said he sees that you're wearing a vintage shirt. Could that be worth some money someday? I'm I'm sponsored by Core. They're great guys. Just look them up on the internet. <laughs> I thought somebody would get a kick out of that. I have some more vintage shirts than this, though. I, I have shirts from companies that don't exist. I have a shirt from people that don't still exist. So that's uh, just save that someday. Testament to my age. So Ashley, Rudy wants to know what interested you to study in this field? Ooh, um, so it's a little messed up, I think, to some extent. Uh, and it was actually, I got interested through ballistics. I've had, uh, I spent most of my childhood in and out of the hospital with various orthopedic surgeries. I was in a wheelchair for a little bit in middle school. So I spent my entire childhood wanting to be a surgeon. And I actually shadowed a surgeon in high school. I volunteered in an ER. I was going to school at, in Delaware for the sciences. And like, that was my plan. And I basically went on a civil war medicine tour and they talked about how 
the advancements of weapons technology altered medical technology on the battlefield. And I was like, huh, that's pretty interesting. I also used to be a ghost hunter, so I'm into weird, morbid things. Um, so I was just really interested in that and, and how, you know, the evolution of arms technology affected soldiers and how it affected, you know, everything else and how it ultimately affects tactics. And now it got, you know, down the military history rabbit hole. Um, and so I was interested through that perspective. And I changed my major to history. My mom told me I better have an effing job when I graduate, which is not something most history majors have. Uh, <laughs> and so I basically just uh, did everything I could to learn about the technology in and of itself. And I got an internship at the Soldiers and Sailors Museum in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, where I'm from. And they basically put several hundred guns in front of me and I had to identify them. And I have never held a gun before in my life. And so it was a very, very quick learning curve. And, uh, and I know I've told this story before, but there was a a firearm on display at the museum it was a Civil War firearm that the soldier had hand carved uh, every battle that he fought it into the stock. And um, that was kind of my like, oh, this is a social of it and how you it's kind of like my daughter kind of fell into historic preservation and just like loves it and now like is riding around town with like pieces of an old roof in her trunk because that's just what she loves and so she's kind of weird and quirky like that. But I think it's neat the way it um, came around that you looked at kind of all the aspects of firearms too and how they affect us. I think firearms really affect history a ton, much more than what people oh yeah credit for at first, even politically. And, you know, it it's one of the most heated topics out there, right? I mean... Well, and I mean, firearms history, the, the interesting thing for a lot of people that aren't in the gun world, and I guess to some extent people who are in the gun world, that they don't realize is that that history is not just like military history or defense history. I mean, it's assembly line, industrial revolution history. Um, you know, firearms have had a hand in a lot of different things over the years, um, you know, Henry Ford visited Winchester's factory before he built the Detroit Highland Park factory. And history kind of gets lost, especially with what you said, the heated political debate, it almost gets kind of pushed to the side, but it is so essential to so much of kind of just understanding the world in general, world history, American history. Uh, I've been trying to do a lot of education um, on a lot of more mainstream and academic communities to, for people to understand that this isn't just violence, this isn't just military, this isn't just, you know, a, a specific bad or good story. It just has influenced the world in so many different ways, which has been interesting. And I think, I guess, Part of my background not growing up around firearms, um, I did come to it from a very kind of like an apathetic perspective on guns. You know, I wasn't a gun person. You know, I was just studying them as an academic and that, you know, if, if you know academics a lot, those who can't do teach, right? Um, and so I came from, from it not judging where people's arguments were coming from. And so I've had, I actually have a really great relationship with a lot of people that really hate guns or academic, you know, universities where they don't do a lot of non-political scholarship because I don't have that preconceived judgment. Um, I can tell when somebody, I can't talk to somebody, you know, it's not going to go anywhere, but I've been able to have some really good conversations across the board, you know, across industries. And so I'm grateful for that. I have my own theory about that. And it's just a theory, but I, I think there's some truth in it. And that is that the reason people want to blame guns for violence is because they really struggle with the fact that human beings are capable of incredible levels of violence towards other human beings. And their mind doesn't want to wrap around that because that's a difficult concept to grasp. And it may not fit in with the narrative of who they think they are and who they think their friends are. And so it's easy psychologically to blame the tool uh, and it, it, keeps the, it keeps the people from being the bad person. You don't have to deal with all the societal issues that go along with a lot of these crimes. So that's just my theory. Well, and you know, I've never done a lot of studies on this, but I have talked to people who study, you know, not knife history or sword history. You can't get into it. Or it's like, if you're going to do guns, you probably shouldn't try to also do all of sword history um, or edge weapon history. Although I do know, you know, some about it. And I just, the one thing that's kind of not consistent with firearms in and of themselves is the way that people respond to violence using other tools. 
uh, throughout history. I mean, in, in some circumstance, you know, a, a blade is a lot more, you know, personal, uh, you know, you've got to be relatively close to, to, you know, have that type of interaction um, and violent interaction. And so, and then you see uh, swords on display at museums and one of the, you know, cool factors and air quotes um, is when a sword has blood on it. You know, people are always super interested in that. And so it's, a weird, why is it firearms? It's probably an anthropological study. If you guys have ever talked to Chelsea Lyons, she's an anthropologist on gun culture. Um, awesome person that you should probably have on the show, sidebar. Um, you know, it's, it, I'm sure it's an anthropological look at why that is like a cool, weird, morbid thing that we wanna see and why, you know, firearms aren't necessarily. That's true. Hmm. Well, and a lot of times too, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but a lot of times too in museum collections, guns that are used in crimes aren't often in those collections, you know, with the exception of like the Ford Theater that actually does have the Derringer that was used to assassinate President Lincoln. A lot of times it's representative examples of, you know, the Thompson was used in the St. Valentine's Day Massacre, but they don't have the St. Valentine's Day Massacre Thompson. So it's a representative example. Um, or the Mob Museum has one of Al Capone's revolvers on loan uh, from the IRS. And, you know, to our knowledge, you know, it wasn't used in a crime. It was just a gun he owned. And so it's this weird thing where like you can get swords that were used in the crime or a hammer that was used in the crime and it's on display. Um, but usually, at least in my experience working with museums across the country, a lot of times it's just a representative example. And I think that that also makes it difficult for people who don't know about guns to kind of see guns as more than that. Um, because you see the Thompson, you see it in the movies, you see it, you know, as a representative piece in the St. Valentine's Day Massacre and gangster history. But then you don't see that that Thompson was used by the Chicago Police Department or that that Thompson was used by the U.S. Postal Service's Security Alliance or, you know, the it was used in, in the military. So when you have to use a representative example, it almost makes people blanket that kind of firearm and not learn a lot of their other history. But I've always found that interesting how we almost very rarely end up having the gun from a crime in the display itself. The Mob Museum, by the way, is a fun museum. Oh, it's great. I'm fixing their gun labels. So if you've been and you're mad about the gun labels, I'm fixing them literally right now. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you so much. It is a cool museum, though. I enjoyed it. Oh, so it's so I, good. So and I, you can drink there. They have a speakeasy in the, ba in the basement, and they just steal their own moonshine. Where is this museum? Uh, it's in Las Vegas. It's uh, off of Fremont Street. Um, and the, I'm going to butcher the name, but it's an old government building that actually held the this is where I'm a bad gangster historian, but like the Kefaver, Kefaver, Kefaver uh, trials, which is a big mob trial that happened across the United States. This is where one of them was held. And so it's in a historic building that's relative to organized crime history. It is also the National Museum of Law Enforcement and organized crime. Um, and so they've actually have a police simulator uh, in there called, uh, I think it's called use of force still. And so it's a add on experience where you go in as a police officer, it's a firearm simulator and go through real world scenarios um, and try to make last minute calls where like, for example, it'll be like, you know, you get a call to a parking lot, someone's trying to break into a car and, you know, you have to talk to that person, they turn around and, you know, what's, what's the decision that you make? Um, I think in one that's like a convenience store, there might be like a person's holding a banana uh, and that person gets shot a lot. Um, you know, they think it's a firearm. And so it's a really interesting thing. Then next to that, they have a crime lab uh, where you can actually learn about autopsy results and some of the reality behind how difficult it is to actually trace, you know, there is no magic magic bullet. Uh, there is no magic kind of way to track down a firearm using a crime if you don't recover that firearm. There are databases in place to kind of match rifling, but even that's really, really difficult. So in addition to getting all of this cool law enforcement organized crime history, there's some really, um, I think, important uh, immersive experiences there. And again, dist uh, distillery and speakeasy in the basement. So I know what I'm doing one night before SHOT Show. Oh, it's totally worth it. And they're open late. And if you go, th I think it's still this way, but if you go through the speakeasy entrance and you buy like a drink, you can go through the museum. So it's probably like $30, you know, in Vegas drink prices. Uh, yeah, I don't think it's that expensive, but <laughs> I don't know. 
Um, I, uh, I, my drinks are usually comped, so. <laughs> and I, I didn't know. kill the guy with the banana and my kids all gave me a hard time about it. They were like, mom, you killed him. And I was like, oh no, I didn't, <laughs> I didn't realize you did the simulator. Sometimes you've got to shoot a hostage. This and my, my kids were like, mom, I can't believe you shot that, that guy. I was like. The director of the museum is really interesting because he's not a gun guy at all. And um, he and I have really fascinating conversation because he's a good friend of mine. And he said, it's been so kind of enlightening to know, to see people go through and how they react. Because some people like get in. All right. She died. So while we're waiting for- All right, there we go. My internet's oh, back, sorry. Um, so I was saying the director of the Mob Museum has been saying how interesting it is to see how people actually respond uh, in those situations. Because he said some people go through and you'll never expect it and they'll shoot everybody. Um, then other people have gone through and they just make the sound. They'll be like pew, pew, but they're not pulling the trigger. So it's, you get this like really interesting case study on how people, <laughs> you know, would handle that situation. And I guess the Las Vegas uh, Police Department has had a lot of really quality training and they're one of the like pillars of law enforcement examples of how to kind of de-escalate situations. So they were super involved in that as well. Yeah, they have a very good budget. I'm a retired fire captain. And uh, when I went to Vegas the first time and I looked at their equipment, I talked to some of the guys and they, their budgets for police and fire out there are just the things that, that cities dream about. They have the best training, the best equipment. Um, and that's a cool thing and they earn it. <laughs> Those guys run a lot. <laughs> they make a lot of calls. They deal with a lot of crap. And uh, so uh, God bless them. I'm glad they've got good stuff because they uh, they definitely earned their money out there. I'm about to yeah. say they, they they definitely work for it. Imagine having to deal with Vegas people all day, <laughs> right? Like, 24 it's, hours a day. Yeah. Um, Rudy asked for not. clarification. What's the name of the museum again? Oh, so it goes by the Mob Museum, but it's the National Museum of Law Enforcement and Organized Crime. Awesome. You can look it up by mob museum though mob museum vegas mob. yeah no yeah, you can find it like that and it's really cool and they they're kind of edgy i mean they're they look into really interesting things like i think they're going to do a program on like the shooting of tupac um and they've done i, I, I thought he was still alive Shh. Don't, don't tell anybody oh, shit. <laughs> I'll, I'll edit this out before I put some. <laughs> it was my internet. It glitched. It glitched. It was, that was the problem. Yeah. <laughs> Greg, what you got? I think you have a giveaway. We have a giveaway. So fix it sticks, and I was supposed to have mine in my hand to show you guys. Anyway, fix it sticks. They are pretty much like the most awesome. Bring with you to the range. Super light but has like everything you can ever imagine to fix any sort of a gun type toolkit. You got built-in uh, torque limiters. You can get, you know, all the different sized bits. All of a sudden there's a cleaning rod in there. You got tools to take down 1911s and Glocks. And I mean, there, there's something for everybody inside of these kits. And they have asked to um, give away their, their all-in-one, all-inclusive kit here on our show. So if you go over to the Shooter's Mindset Facebook page, there's a post up there right now. Um, and it says something along the lines of, share this post and like Fix It Sticks Hunting and Shooting for a chance to be entered to win this. So go over to the Facebook page, share that post, like Fix It Sticks. And then next week on our show live, we will choose a winner. And you'll get like this three or $400 super awesome toolkit that'll make all of your friends jealous. So. Yeah. I would like to apologize to Fix It Sticks for me laughing because my cat came up behind me and was very, <laughs> being very demanding. I guess it's dinner time. <laughs> so I was not laughing at your product. I was laughing at my cat. <laughs> All right. Uh, what we got on stuff here? Let's see where we got next. Um, Oh, this is the big one. So you recently testified on a Senate Judiciary Committee on the Constitution's hearing about ghost guns. Why don't you tell us uh, a little bit about how you got involved in that and what all what all was involved in your testimony? Yeah. Um, so I actually have done a couple of things recently. I also worked on the Miller v. Becerra and Albonta case, um, which you know was the assault weapons ban that got overturned and now stayed. Um, but with the testimony, it was kind of like that. I've been working on cases 
like Miller, I did work on um, one of the bump stock cases. And so this hearing came about and the NSSF actually contact, contacted me and asked if I'd be interested in speaking to Senator Ted Cruz's office um, about showing up as a witness. I had never done anything like this. This is very different than expert witness testimony. Um, and so they gave me a call. They interviewed me. And this was the Thursday before my testimony. My testimony was the following Tuesday. Uh, they asked me a bunch of questions. And I really felt like at the end of this that I was never going to hear from them again. I got the whole, we'll be in touch. And I was like, I don't know if that means they are going to be in touch. And so I waited and then Friday, pretty late afternoon, they called and they were like, we'd like you to come to DC on Tuesday. <laughs> so, and they were like, all right, your oral or your written report is due Monday and you're, you'll give an oral five minute testimony on Tuesday. And they said that my oral testimony could get submitted as my written one, but I can't, I could never just let it sit that way. So I did submit a 20 page footnoted report on privately made firearms, as well as the utilization of marketing terminology, like ghost guns, like universal background checks, uh, like assault weapons, terms that people feel like, like it makes people feel like they know what that is without really knowing what the law actually states. And so I, it was a kind of multifaceted report. Um, and then I went Tuesday morning and I loved it. I thought it was a ton of fun. I actually, if you've seen the testimony, which you can see it on my page or just go to the Senate Judiciary Committee on the constitution, you can see it. Um, I had a really good back and forth with Senator Blumenthal during my uh, testimony. He was asking me a bunch of questions. And then he actually did talk to me both before and after the hearing. and read my testimony and actually had some really complimentary things to say. So that was pretty cool. That was cool. I thought you handled yourself very well. And um, even to the point when he kind of tried to get you to go into your personal opinions and, you know, what do you think about universal background checks? And, and yeah, you started by, you know, saying that, you know, trying to go factual and then you he, he asked you again, well, I'm asking for your personal opinion. And I thought yeah. the answer was great. Yeah, that oh, was epic. I was dying inside a little bit. <laughs> like my heart was like, I was dead. Because I don't talk about my personal opinions. Um, I guess I learned afterwards from a couple of my friends that are, you know, on the Hill, that that's a pretty standard uh, political tactic um, when somebody is, you know, against you is to try to get them to say that your personal opinion, because then your personal opinions on the record, which can be used to discredit your testimony later. Um, uh, but I, I thought the whole thing was a little weird and I think he kind of painted himself into a corner, um, because we weren't talking about background checks. We were talking about quote unquote ghost guns or privately made firearms and 3d printed firearms, same thing, but, um, and so like we weren't talking about that. So he started asking me about background checks and then he got into universal background checks, which was a huge mistake because he initially just asked me about background checks. So I think maybe in his mind, he meant universal background checks, but he didn't say that. Um, and then when he came back with that, so many people support ba universal background checks, it gave me like the perfect opening, which by the way, like, I feel like I full on black out when these things are happening. So like I give credit <laughs> to whatever is happening in my brain it is not actually conscious but like my response basically was yeah universal background checks are the same as you know ghost guns you know it's a term that we can all get behind because it sounds good but that isn't necessarily something that's enforceable and or actually what they're doing because if you look at the proposed amendment with the atf they're not really ban they're not banning privately made firearms they're they're well they're, they spent a lot of time trying to define what is a firearm which is a utter train wreck and we can talk about that mm -hmm. but they also <laughs> um their whole like logic for why they need to change the definition is immensely faulty which i touched on in my testimony but um but most of it's all in transfer like i mean you can still make it um as long as they understand what the definition of firearm is it's the transfer that needs the um serialization and the record keeping so it wasn't even helping and the and the amendment came out the Friday before. I thought the hearing was about the amendment, but I might have been the only person in the room who had read it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm not gonna lie like that that entire video was just like perfection on your part. Well, thank you. It was kind of funny because the Republican senators, there weren't a lot in the room when they read their testimonies, they clearly read mine. And so I had prepared this perfect 
five minute, you know, oral statement. And then I heard like, you know, uh, Senator Lee from Utah started talking about John Moses Browning and teed it up very similarly to my report. And like, so I was like, like I'm scratching stuff out, like making changes. So I had to rip there for the last bit of it, but it was cool that they read it and they thought it was valid enough for them to, you know, to read it. But I was kind of like, oh, I was gonna see that. Now I can't say it because if I say it, they're gonna be like, oh, it's just that like silly girl who wore pink on the hill, which was, I did not know that was not a thing. That was my bad, a hundred percent. I thought I did not know it was Navy and it was a Navy and black scenario. Um, but, you know, I know if I had read the same thing that it would probably have hurt my, you know, credibility because people already assume that I don't know what I'm talking about. So I kind of had to think on my toes there pretty quick, but I wasn't, a hun I wasn't totally embarrassed when I heard it back. So that is a win for me. Shocking to me that a politician would steal something and use it as their own. <laughs> it's surprising to me. Um, I'll have I'll have to go back and watch the video because I'm not sure I believe you. But uh, <laughs> if that happened, I'll take your word for it. You seem pretty sharp. But uh, well, and my my report is also if you go to the Senate Judiciary Committee on the I'm probably screwing up the title uh, Committee on the Constitution, and you go to that hearing, it's um, Stop Gun Violence: Cola Ghost Colon Ghost Guns um they're doing a series of them um if you go there you can watch the video and then if you scroll down on my thing you can actually read my report so can you talk about the california thing yeah i've been talking those. about that Am I yeah i can talk drunk? about it okay. i mean again i had the very like the least interesting part of the whole case but this is also something that i'm really appreciative about because i've been saying since i got involved in firearms history and like i said i didn't come with a preconceived notion of guns one way or the other because I didn't grow up around them and I didn't grow up necessarily hating them. Um, so I have seen the value in understanding the history. It's, yeah, it's always political and it's never 100% objective and, you know, history is biased, you know, all of those things. Um, but I found that history, there's a lot of there's not a lot of knowledge about gun history because there's not a lot of actual scholarship on it that's traditional scholarship that would be respected and utilized in these scenarios. And it's the peer reviewed academic system. And so as a result, there's just a lot of misinformation out there. And I've found in my research and working with other people that a lot of people that are kind of anti-gun or you know want to see an assault weapons ban, they have no concept of you know, one, what the law actually says, uh, and the fact that it doesn't ban anything. Um, and then also, you know, the, the rationales for why they are doing it are historically flawed. Um, and it's as simple as with my testimony, you know, I wasn't fighting, you know, one way or the other. They asked me to write a statement on the rationale and the penal code and what, uh, what features were being regulated and what, you know, the semi-automatic center fire, uh, which is part of the bigger, you know, overarching bubble um, and the history of that. And because a lot of the arguments that get put forward and they're cited most recently in the Heller decision is that something is uh, not in common use and unusually dangerous. And I've used this on a couple of cases um, because most arguments that are being made in, in the assault weapons case is that are that these things are new that they haven't been a part of gun you know gun technology and so I went through all of the features um, I started off with kind of and you can read my deposition on firearms policy coalition's website uh, my deposition and my statement but I started with the fact that the logic behind civilians not owning military weapons is flawed because the there's always been a kind of interconnectivity between military firearms technology and civilian technology and in fact civilians have until recently always had the better technology. Uh, you know, the military is always, you know, 30 years behind. Uh, <laughs> they still want their, you know, their single shots, you know, in the Plains Indian Wars when everybody else has repeaters kind of thing. And so, you know, civilian arms have what, been what drove the understanding of technology that's benefited the military. And so I did a lot of that. And then I broke down semi-automatic technology, which has been around since the 1880s. Uh, semi-automatic handguns have been around since at least the early 1890s. Um, and I do point out that uh, according to the ATF, the definition of firearm, it, well, it's convoluted. So the definition of an antique, uh, which is not legally a firearm, but still an operable firearm, is made before 1898. And there's a couple of other parts of that. Um, and so there are semi-automatics that are not 
federally considered firearms, they're antiques. So this is not new technology. Um, I also track the history of center fire, which is early 1800s um, technology. I think there's an early example in like 1808 and then 1812. And um, it takes a while for it to get into a full metallic cartridge stage. I think that's like 1850s. And then I go into the bigger things, magazines. Magazines have been around since the 1600s, uh, you know, Guns with more than 10 rounds have been around in, you know, in common civilian use um, since the 16, 1700s. Uh, and the important thing in that is to note that this, again, is a civilian thing because it's expensive, it's, you know, customized, it's an individual, you know, piece, and it doesn't really make sense for battlefield tactics at the time. You know, you, it was a, you know, shoulder to shoulder fighting, so you didn't need necessarily the accuracy of rifling, which has been around since 1498 not military firearms, not adopted, you know, overall in the infantry world until the Civil War in America. Um, and so like all of these things that they're making the argument for, these are not common use, these are not normal things, uh, have been around a lot of them since the 1600s, many of them since the 1800s. And so my report wasn't like, these are bad, or they're good, and you should do this. My report was like, here's the history, this is the rationale, and this is why that doesn't make sense. Um, you know, and I actually, when I was deposed by the state, the attorney that I had was like fascinated by it. We had a really great conversation during the deposition and after the deposition, he just really thanked me uh, for being very matter of fact about, you know, this is it. I don't, I can't change it for you, you know, do what you will with it. And so uh, that's been my role in a lot of the cases. Um, and the Heller decision, you know, not loopholes, but the not common use and unusually dangerous is something that I get brought in a lot on because of the fact that these things have been in common use for centuries. Um, and if that's your, and that was the same with a lot of the, you know, ATF definitions with the, you know, new proposed amendment on privately made firearms is, you know, do what you're going to do, but you know, I don't have to agree with it personally, but you know, whatever. Um, but don't have a faulty rationale because the second you have a faulty rationale and then also don't understand the technology to the point where you're not regulating what you say you're regulating, um, then it's always going to be um, something that will just continue to circulate in the litigation spiral. Um, you know, if you really want to see certain things banned, then do it right. You know, I, I, I you know, and, and I've talked to some of my friends recently that are very anti-gun and I, you know, and they'll talk about banning assault weapons and I'll be like, you know, that that doesn't mean what you think it means. And if you actually knew what it meant, you should be pretty pissed because it doesn't mean any of those things. So from both sides, as actually what I said in my testimony at the end is that, you know, you're letting down your constituency when you tell them you're doing something that you're not doing and then you celebrate it like you're doing it. And then 10 years down the line, when there's a loophole that gets litigated, you blame everybody else. Sorry, I just got in a real soapbox there. I'll, I'll get down. That's what I wanted you to do. <laughs> no, I'm about to say, stay up on your box. You've earned it. <laughs> You know, but it's something to me that shouldn't be political. You know, if you are not coming to something with malice intent, if you're not coming with the, the purpose of, like if you genuinely believe in these things, um, and I always say, you know, I know we can infer a lot, but I'm not gonna guess what's in somebody else's head, that's not my job. But um, if you genuinely believe in these regulations and these things, why wouldn't you, you know, take the time to understand it? And why wouldn't you make sure that it was doing what it's supposed to do and that to me is weird <laughs> it's just so weird and it also makes me realize that like i know a lot about guns although i'll never know you know as much as many people but you know imagine just if this is just as screwed up how screwed up everything is mm -hmm. that's actually what i was thinking is there's <laughs> um hot political topics that i won't go into because they're not relevant to this show and lots of people have lots of opinions about and i'm not going to go into it but I know so many people that have opinions about it strongly one way or the other, and they don't understand. They yeah. do not understand. Well, and to some extent, um, you know, the, the big difficulty with firearms, and I'm not saying if we had better scholarship, it would change everything, but I do think it would help. Um, and part of the issue is if you've got a politician, you know, they are being, they have people who are doing the research for them. Um, they, you know, and, and to be, I'm going to be fair to politicians for a second, but there's no way they can know everything. They're just, just not possible. Um, so they've got people doing the research for them and providing them with that research. And when there isn't firearms research, 
that is, you know, sound, and I can kind of expand on that in a second, if there's nothing for those people to pull from, you know, how are they supposed to, you know, if they're all, if the only scholarship out there is completely political, one way or the other, how are they supposed to kind of weed through that and come up with what they should be telling people? And I, and I have had conversations with Republicans as well that'll say things and I'm like, that's not right. And that actually really doesn't help your case. Um, you know, because they're just, there isn't that kind of repository for them to go to. And what I meant by sound research is, and uh, this is probably super boring, but I think it's, I think it's important. So I'm going to say it. Um, in academia, you've got a peer reviewed system. And so what that means, it, you know, basically is like peers review it. So you write scholarship, you footnote it, you cite it. Um, and then, you know, your peers, um, they review that material and find out if your arguments are, you know, sound, poke holes in your arguments. Um, but one thing that sometimes they do is point out uh, inaccuracies in the actual technicals of history, because historians are not fact, you know, you know, we're not fact prophets. Like we're, you know, we take facts and try to make bigger pictures and theories behind them. Um, and so the problem that comes in with guns is there are no peers in that system. So a good example of that is there's a book called Arming America uh, by Michael Belial, which by the way is panned now by both all sides of the gun debate, but he came up with this book. It won the Bancroft, which is a super fancy, um, you know, title in the history book world. Uh, and he made it all up. He basically made the argument that civilians didn't really have firearms in the early colonies. And uh, I think the NRA may have gone through his footnotes and he was challenged after the book. It, it, it was a dissertation, so it went through peer review. It won a prestigious award. Um, and then when they asked him to produce the evidence in his footnotes, he was like, I can't remember if it was a fire or a flood, but something happened and he didn't have them. So he made it up. Um, and he still gets cited today by people that are trying to kind of push a certain thing. But the difficulty that comes down into having, you know, research that people can utilize on all sides um, and even just the public, you know, to understand this when you don't have peers in that system, because usually that those published works then gets filtered down to more popular histories, which gets, you know, then disseminated to the public. If you just start out without peers that can call you on your bullshit then you get a lot of stuff that's not right. Um, and I've written lots of book reviews about that where these books are like praised and I'm like, the technology is not right. And my question is, would you have concluded something differently if you, if you knew different? Um, and so that's the biggest issue is having kind of that base because the scholarship that has been done in the gun world that's not political is usually done by collectors. And some of that history is amazing, but without a vetting system, you know, how, if you're not knowledgeable, how do you know what's good and what's not? And unfortunately, a lot of that scholarship isn't gonna get brought into, you know, what's considered the ivory tower um, because it's not vetted like that. It's not a university press. And so there's like literally nothing for anybody to pull from other than talking to people that know. And then you also have to take us up on our word. I could be just totally bullshitting you right now. <laughs> I hope I'm not. <laughs> it's very true. Um, I, you know, I'm a nurse and everything that we do is peer reviewed also. All research is regulated and peer reviewed and checked and you have to check your facts. I mean, I really wish that the general public, one of my pet peeves is that people are voting for you know, president, Senate, House, all of it, mayor even, and they have no idea of what they're voting for. Yeah. They have no idea. They vote for, or they decide to get behind a bill and they have no idea what they're voting for. And half of the legislators don't know what they're voting for, so. Well, and the way they release them so quickly to when they need, you know, to actually be decided on. I mean, it's a lot of stuff. I you know, slogging through Friday night, trying to write this report before the testimony on the amendment. I mean, it's a lot, you know, that goes into that. And I honestly, I need to do more on the, the, the brace um, one that's out there. I need to dive into it a little bit more, maybe write something on it, but. You yeah, know, please do. I got this brand new thing. I want to like work at some point. I may have a hunting gun that has one. So. <laughs> But yeah, um, like I think the most crazy, or I guess probably the most public example of it recently has been like the uh, COVID relief bill. And you know, it's like a couple pages about like, oh yeah, we're going to do this stuff to like help our country with COVID. And then we're going to like donate trillions of dollars to bullshit. 
and nobody ever got to that point in the pages. Like, yeah. they fell asleep. Yeah. Well, and I, I think there was something and, you know, forgive me now, I'm just talking on Facebook, you know, <laughs> Facebook, you know, statements, which are always true. Because um, yeah, the reality is, is I don't, I'm not always, I try to stay um, a little bit ignorant of a lot of the stuff that's going on um, so that when I do get brought into a situation, I can come to it from, uh, you know, a, as little bias as possible. Um, but I know that there was something even with the stand, was it, no, the, uh, concealed carry, uh, constitutional carry in Texas. I think there were some other things hiding in there as well. Um, that I swear I saw on like FPC or something, but you know, it's, it's interesting. And I, you know, don't, I could never be in politics. That's why I'm like, I give you the information and you do what you will with it. Uh, whether I like it or not. Kind of thing. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> Even at work, like I'm, I'm, I'm highly experienced. I'm paid very well, but like I'm, I'm down on the totem pole, so the people above me deal with that BS, and then I just do what my boss tells me to. It's, it's much nicer that way. Yeah. What do you think the future holds for gun legislation? Like, are what are the other big battles coming up right now? Oh, well, that means I should have done my research. Uh, I mean, obviously. <laughs> Obviously, the assault weapons uh, case is going to continue to be a big one because, I mean, if it can continue to be overturned in the state of California, I mean, that really will put a monkey wrench into, you know, one of the key political points in Biden's presidential campaign. Um, so, I mean, that is like a very big one to watch. And, you know, I know I saw a lot of negativity from both. Uh, I got death threats for the first time um, over the research that I did on this. Uh, and I posted about it a couple of days ago uh, for both. <laughs> Um, but you know, a lot, there was a lot of negativity of, well, it's just going to get overturned. And it was like, well, yeah, I mean, like nobody was <laughs> like, nobody was assuming that it was just going to be done. Um, so, I mean, obviously that's going to be a big one. Uh, I think the, the quote unquote ghost guns is going to, they're going to, honestly, I think anything they're saying that they're going to propose is going to get pushed forward. Um, I guess maybe I've just become completely cynical to believe that, you know, I can say all I want, but you know, it's ultimately going to happen. Although I have been told that some comments, uh, that have been put into the ATF have actually really influenced that. Um, so that one, pistol brace is weird to me. Um, why that popped up? It's kind of a bump stocky, you know, kind of random thing. Uh, universal background checks, um, you know, obviously are really big. Red flag laws are a big conversation. Uh, whether or not I've got any history to <laughs> add to those cases, we'll see. Um, but then I think what people don't realize, and now I'm going to get on to my museum -y one, is that a lot of the bills that are being proposed, it'll probably never go through. Um, but there have been some very specific bills that have targeted gun collectors and historic firearms. That's crazy. Um, yeah, and so, and this is something we deal with all the time. So if you're a non-government museum, you are bound by all the same laws as civilians. Um, so for example, the Cody can't have unregistered NFA. People think it can, it makes it very awkward sometimes, but we can't. Uh, we also can't have any post 86 machine guns. Uh, we do not apply to the law letter. Obviously there's ways, you know, around it with a manufacturer license, but that's again, representative pieces, not the actual, you know, historical pieces. Um, you know, so the museum and collectors are very much affected by these laws and they're, you know, basically never thought of, we're like an afterthought, uh, if we're even a thought. Um, and so I was meeting with, uh, a couple of years ago, I think it was, Mansion, Senator Mansion, about the universal background checks, and I brought up. I'm like, listen, I don't know if there's a provision in there for uh, historic firearms, but you know, if you do this, this is really going to impact the museum field because a lot of museums don't have FFLs, um, you know, and and they they go through other channels in order to legally have firearms in their collections. So when you look at some of these things, the bigger ones, one look at see, you know, is this going to even affect the ability to preserve the history for us to learn from it or know anything in the future? And that's not just a social, you know, history or question. That's like when the military wants to develop something, you know, down the road and they need to go look at the example and it's nowhere, 
you know, because either the museum had to not have it or they had to like basically like pour molten lava down, the, you know, into the and make it completely inoperable so you can't research the, the mechanics of it. Uh, you know, so those are, you know, the museums, um, you know, and the idea of historic preservation is very much affected by it. Um, I do know how badly it was affected in, in Australia. We, I did write a letter of support for a museum that was going to have to destroy everything. Um, in their collection. And I believe they did ultimately get an amnesty on it. Um, but yeah, I mean, when you look at these things, one, look at the fact that they are coming after antiques uh, in some respects, which will impact the gun collector market and gun collectors are probably your least concerning group of people. Um, and then look at the major things and, and realize that it also impacts our ability to study this in the future. Uh, and to me, that's non-political. You love guns. And put them in a museum, help preserve the history. If you hate guns, you know, get them off the street, put them in a museum, but we're losing our ability to completely, you know, even study it moving into the future, which will impact us, you know, as a culture and as, you know, in technology and anything. So that's to me the most, well, not the most important part, but a really important thing to consider when all of these laws are going forward. And I think a real great talking point for people who are even, you know, uncomfortable or antagonistic towards firearms ownership. Oh, you know, that's something I never thought about. I, I never occurred to me that, that museums that have firearms would would have to be FFL or or, or have some type of an exemption. And as, so what you're saying as it stands right now, museums have no exemption whatsoever. Unless they're a government museum. And even that wasn't written for museums. It was just government institutions. So they can collect pretty much everything. Uh, the example that I use in England is that they actually have a firearms museum license. So if you're a museum under their accreditation, um, you can collect pretty much anything regardless of if the civilian population can have it. Now there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of hills to uh, climb with that. For example, you know, you know, do you want a license, you know, altogether? Do you add another license? But then also, you know, how do you define a museum? If you go off of the American Alliance of Museums accreditation, which is kind of the gold standard in our field, that's only 5% of museums. So you're not really moving it forward. But then on the other side is, you know, the, the government is going to want to know how do you prevent Billy Bob's garage museum? You know, so it's this, it's not simple, um, you know, and, but other in Europe, it's not an issue. <laughs> you know, they protect their museums, they protect their history, even if they have major, you know, gun laws um, and gun restrictions. So it is something to consider. And I think it's a, it is a really fair talking point with a lot of people, regardless of where they sit. Um, and back to kind of the larger question of gun laws, I think, you know, there's a lot of them being proposed right now, but from my experience in the expert witness world with history, until we actually know what we're talking about, it's basically things will get passed or not and just be bogged down in litigation, you know, and ultimately neuter what people, you know, want them to do um, one way or the other. And so, like, I think that, like, there's lots of stuff going, you know, getting proposed and there's not a lot of knowledge out there on the technology in and of itself. So it's just going to be a train wreck for ever. So essentially what you're saying is they're, they're basically trying to hold a trial and, and find somebody guilty with horrible evidence. And so the evidence ends up getting challenged. They're passing all these supposed bills with, with, you know, with no research and no real knowledge of what it is they're even trying to do so that they never hold up. And you would think that if they really cared about the cause that they're trying to forward, that they would take the time to actually learn what it is they're doing and, and, and they would propose something that would be, uh, would withstand litigation, you know, yeah, examination I mean, about litigation. Sorry. And to some extent, you know, as we talked about earlier, I feel like, you know, nothing you do is going to be, you know, uh, you know to be so infallible that it you know can't be litigated because people will litigate everything. Uh, and they do do research. I mean, it's a lot of like statistics, um, and that type of research that comes into it, but the lack of knowledge of the, what we call material culture of it, um, which is the technology behind it, that's where it's, you know, all severely lacking on, on all sides, really, when you look at it. I mean, there's a lot of really knowledgeable, you know, people who study technology with firearms, especially in the modern day people out, you know. I would I, I avoid you know talking about a lot of modern things because I sound stupid, um, but you know there's lots of people who are very knowledgeable in that. But the actual kind of evolution and the history and how nitty gritty it gets is not as well known. And I know a lot of really good people in the country that do study that, but there's like, you know, 
maybe 20 of us. 20 of us that are really, you know, working with collections that would get brought in as authorities on the subject matter. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it seems like a never ending loop in general. Um, exactly. and mouse, I guess. Something for them to talk about something that the politicians are big on pretending to be something that, that's really all it, it, it turns out to be. Well, here's a really random comparison, which is not, you know, not really a comparison, but it it's it was something interesting to me in graduate school. I read an article on, uh, I was taking an article on vernacular landscapes. Jennifer, your daughter probably knows what that is. Um, <laughs> and um, one thing we read was, um, and I can send you, I don't remember what it is, but I know I have it, was on the history of allergies. And allergies are a new you know, I think like maybe late 18th century or late 19th century, you know, 20th century thing. Like they, you know, there's really not a lot of historical evidence to show that people had allergies. Um, and then it was a big deal with like hay fever resorts. Um, you know, out West Theater Roosevelt had lots of allergies, you know, so people, um, and then they carried allergies. So like people would get on the trains to get away from the allergies of the city and then they would bring the allergies out there. Um, and the point of this, I swear, there's a point, is the fact that the conclusion of that book was the fact that, you know, allergies came out of nowhere and it's this really big problem and, and uh, you know, in international culture, it's horrible. We all know how terrible it is. I've been sniffling this whole time, um, but that, the you know field to fix allergies has really been a band-aid um, on how just to treat them and not how to fix the problem. Um, and I think that that was that was really interesting to me because I think it applies to so many things that we see, which is we do uh, band-aid politics. We do things that we you know put a band-aid on it for now and maybe it'll help, maybe it won't, and then you know. But we're not treating any root cause of anything. Very true. I realized I got into vernacular landscapes and nursing and then like in my head was like, oh my God, I hope I don't say something stupid. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know about vernacular landscapes, but I have heard the word come out of my daughter's mouth, I'm pretty sure. So she probably does. But. Oh yeah, it's cool. It's the study of, you know, human interaction in the in, on landscapes and how it affects culture and all kinds of stuff. That's fun. <laughs> oh, she loves it. I Google it and I still don't understand it. <laughs> I just stick to my robots. Do we have any lives, Greg? We do not. Okay. So have I asked you this last time on the show, and so I'm going to ask you again and see if it's anything different. I don't know if I remember what you said last time, but you get to play with all kinds of fun, fascinating historical firearms. What has been your favorite? So I'm, I'm positive that I am not going to answer the same because I think I answer differently every time. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of really cool stuff. And now I can't even remember like what I've been saying recently. <laughs> um, I think one that I'm going to steal it from Danny because I have said it before. Danny's curator now of the Cody Fires Museum. Uh, but the Burton Light Machine mm -hmm. Rifle is pretty badass. Uh, it, there's only one it, well known. Anytime you say there's only one, someone will be like, look at mine. Um, but there's only one known. It's at the Cody Firearms Museum. And it is a selective fire intermediate cartridge, quote unquote, assault rifle. I'm going to get a lot of people mad for that. But by assault rifle, I mean the uh, DIA definition of it, of intermediate cartridge, selective fire, blah, 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 blah. Um, and it's got, you know, twin top mounted uh, magazines and it was developed in the end or towards the end of World War One. So predating the Sturmgewehr, which gets all credit for that style of firearm by decades. And it's on Battlefield One, I think. Yeah. They did not ask our permission, nor did they consult us. Uh, but there is a really interesting thing that I think is in, I don't play video games, but I peaked at Nintendo 64, but Danny does. And I think that the Battlefield 1 Burton has, um, oh, I think it's incendiary rounds, maybe, um, which is a fallacy. They never, they were never chambered for that. Um, I know the guy that has all of the like ammo test cards from it. And there was never, it was like a, it was a apocryphal story that they were made to shoot down like hot air balloons and that's not true. Goodness. So, um, you co-hosted the show, The Master of Arms, on the Discovery Channel. That's on Discovery Plus now. Um, tell us a little bit about the show and like what your role was, what the show was about, all that cool stuff. 
Sadly, it is no more. Uh, but if you like Fortune Fire, we only have one season, but it's worth a look if you can get past the annoying hosts. But it's essentially Forged in Fire, but with other technology. So there's blades, there's bows, crossbows, and firearms. Uh, weird axe pistol in the premiere episode. And I know it is on Discovery Plus because my friend sent me a screenshot and was like, hey, look at this. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, it was, I mean, it was a lot of fun. We did, like I said, we did one season of it. And it highlighted a lot of really great craftsmen who are doing really pretty wonderful things. So if you watch... The show on Discovery Plus, um, you can probably look up, I think, all of the craftsmen and women from the show, and they've been kind of crushing it ever since. And one of them made a sword for my wedding to cut the cake with. And a couple of them were already pretty famous in their own niche communities, but I enjoyed it. I'd love to do, you know, regular TV again. I still have, you know, my regular appearances on Gun Stories with Joe Montana on the Outdoor Channel. And I do a lot of one-off stuff, but... It was nice. It was very like calming to do a TV show when you're talent, <laughs> not if you're anywhere else in that, but you know, it was very simple. You know, I walked out on set, I said like five things. And then 15 minutes later I was eating Cheetos uh, and everybody else was doing all the work. Uh, so I really enjoyed it. I mean, you with TV is kind of funny because I do so much research that's held under such scrutiny, but TV, nobody wants to see that. And if you do want to see that, you are not the majority. And so, especially when you're starting a show, you, you know, don't go too deep. And so basically I would show up and say something that was like very surface level of my knowledge. And people were like, oh my God, you're a genius. Tell me more. So like, I, it really was a great ego boost for me because it was not that hard because the, not, the information we were putting out there was to me very basic. So were they crunchy or soft cheaters? Uh, crunchy. Uh, I mean, like I like both. So but first off, I'm lactose crunchy intolerant. So I'm lactose intolerant, so I shouldn't be talking about eating Cheetos. But I like Cheetos and that's either Oreos or Famous Amos cookies. I eat them together. You know, that's not actually real cheese in the Cheetos, right? And that's. Like uh, I think there is some milk product in it. I mean, I still eat it and I don't die, so that's fine. You know, goldfish though are made with grilled cheese. It's part of the branding on the bag. Uh, but yeah, no, Cheetos and Famous Amos or Oreos, eat them at the same time. It's, it's a wonderful snack. What is the, uh, is there a good, uh, we know some folks out in Phoenix. So how did you end up in Phoenix? Is there, is, was it gun related that you guys ended up in Phoenix? Uh, no, my husband's born and raised here. So we've been together for almost seven years and I just moved here last year. So for the first six years of our relationship, we did long distance, Wyoming to Phoenix, back and forth, back and forth. Oh gosh. Yeah. What a change in climate. I love it. I hate being cold. Yes, I do too. Overrated. Yes, I would agree. Makes my joints hurt. Yes, mine too. I, I, I like to say I have too much metal in my body to live somewhere where it's cold. So, yeah. Which is not a joke. I, I actually do have too much metal in my body to live somewhere where it's cold. They took all of mine out, so Good I have <laughs> So what... Do you have any upcoming projects or interesting industry events or cool testimonies on Capitol Hill or anything coming up? Uh, no testimonies and no expert stuff that I can talk about. It's not public knowledge yet, um, but I've got some cool TV projects in the works. So keep an eye out for that. Fingers crossed, you know how TV is. Uh, but I'm also doing, I'm working for an auction house now. I'm consulting for an auction house. If you are familiar with the auction house Cowens, they did, firearms was a big main part of their business, but they did other things. Well, they sold to a company named Heinemann's, uh, which is a big auction company out of Chicago. And they never did guns before. They do high fashion, high art, uh, decorative art, Americana, and they bought Cowan. So I've been helping them with kind of rebranding so that people understand. The people that want to make sure that it's still Cowan's, it's still Cowan's, um, you know, but that it is, you know, under new ownership and that ownership is great. So I've been helping them with branding. Soon I'll have their social media up and running um, and then helping with acquisition of collections. So if anybody wants to sell a collection, give me a call. I can help with that. Yeah, it was funny earlier when you mentioned about the museum licensing, my first thought was, yes, there'll be two museums on every block in Texas uh, and in the general exactly. southeast uh, part of the United States. That there'll be tens of thousands of uh, firearm museums around the country. 
Oh, oh yeah. Well, and I'm also, like I said, the museum world reopened. So I'm working on a big project up in Montana uh, with a museum that has the Matthew Browning collection. Uh, Matthew Browning was the brother of, only full brother of John Moses Browning. Um, it's his son or grandson's collection, but there's a lot of original stuff from Jonathan Browning, who was John and Matthew's dad. Um, and so it's a pretty cool collection. I'm working with the family to do an exhibition at that museum. So uh, like I said, lots of museum random projects at Mob Museum. So keep an eye out for, and I'll post on my social media when new exhibitions are opening. That's very cool. I always like watching your social media. I'll be like, oh, look what she's doing now. It's fascinating, you know. A little bit of history, a little bit of service dog, a little bit of food. I think is a pretty accurate assessment of my social media. <laughs> I try to make it equal though. I try to make it equal. Got to give them all the equal love. Yeah, exactly. Although my dog gets more love, I think, than anything else. I think he's more famous than me at this point. <laughs> Greg, are there any more lives? There are not. Nobody knows what to add. Exactly. I'm, I'm pretty sure we've covered everything under the sun. Well, with that, if we don't have any lives, I think we will wrap it up with shout out. So mm -hmm. I'll let you start. You usually start. You, uh, you've you been the best guest I've I've seen on the show by far. So uh, oh, thank you. Yeah, yeah. You're, you're you're in fact, you're probably a little smart or too smart for many myself and many of the other viewers. But uh, I'm sure we're we're all fascinated by uh, it's, it's interesting to see the things that go on that people don't know go on. You see a part of the industry that most of us know exists, but don't really know anything about it. And we have all these conceptions of how the politics works and all of that. So it, it was interesting to get a firsthand account of how all that actually takes place. So I appreciate you coming on and taking time to tell us all that. That was very informative. Thank you. I yeah. had fun. Yeah, I was about to say, we'll, we'll start off with shouting out to Ashley. I would honestly say that, like, I captured more of, or I was more on the level of Brian Litz when he was on the show, um, you know, the the literal rocket scientist, uh, <laughs> than, than your level. So it was, it was amazing getting to hear what you had to say and, and kind of hearing about you know, from somebody that actually knows what's going on inside of the world of politics and and, that, and, and history and everything. It, it was great talking to you. Um, you. So we have GSL suppressors right here. Keep me nice and civilized. Um, my rifle nice and quiet. Um, shooters and sharpshooters of Augusta, our local indoor and outdoor ranges. Um, PDC Custom, the most beautiful rifle chassis known to man. They're available in lime green and normal human colors. Um, Shooter Royal Powder. Um, I got a, I'll make y'all jealous over here, like, you know, just like a case of powder sitting there, whatnot, um, so that I can actually continue to shoot this year, which is going to be really cool. Hunter's HD Gold, um, because I am blind as a bat, and I can actually see stuff when I wear their glasses. They have, you know, you can just go on their website, buy a set of glasses right off the shelf, we'll send them right to you. You can send them lenses, they'll put their lenses in them, you can send them their prescription, they'll put them in your, your frames or their frames, like... If you're if you're blind or not blind and want to see better while shooting, hit them up. Um, fix it sticks. Again, reminder: go to our Facebook page. There's a fix it stick post that says something along the lines of "Share this post to be entered to win like four hundred dollars worth of super awesome tools." Um, share that. We'll do a giveaway on that show. Um, Vortex to keep your rifle nice and clean. And I wanted to. Tonight, say thank you to Trigger Tech just for being an awesome company. They don't sponsor anything, but like they build really good stuff. They stand on their products. If you need to figure out what trigger to put in your rifle, the answer is Trigger Tech. They are very nice guys. I deal with them quite often. And uh, when I have to call up there, they're always very, very nice people. Yeah. All for you. Me? Uh, I want to thank the guy who bought my H4350. I told you guys I had 16 pounds of H4350, and I put it up for sale, and it it sold in about 12 minutes, maybe. May, may have been 13 minutes. But, I can't uh, believe it took that long. I won't I won't tell you how much I got for it, but I I, I got market price for it. I mean, it wasn't wasn't more than everybody else was selling. So, uh, you know, 
I, I, I'm putting that towards the uh, cost of the air conditioning for the shop. So. Putting it to good work, good use. Yeah. Good use. Ashley, how about you? You got any shout outs? Oh, I mean, I guess I could shout out to my husband, Mark, who hasn't had dinner yet because I've been on this call. <laughs> um, but I don't know, make sure to check out the Cody Firearms Museum. Like I said, they got a new exhibition and uh, it's a relatively new museum. So you can plan your trip to Cody. And we've got a podcast, History Unloaded, that will be airing its new season, I guess, July 9th. I am horrible at promoting my podcast. I'm sorry, I forgot that that's a thing. Uh, so yeah, just if you wanna hear about history, museums, guns, uh, our podcast covers it all. And yeah, go see Cody, the Cody Museum. And if you can't see it, Pester Danny. He's the curator and he's pretty awesome and can answer most people's questions. He is funny. Oh, he's so, awesome. So funny. Somebody, I know. I, enjoy, I always enjoy it. Shot show going by y'all's booth. It's always fun. Um, if somebody wanted to use your consulting services, where can they find? Yeah, so we do a website, although I haven't updated it in a while. It's theguncode.com. But then also just go to my social media at History and Heels on Instagram, at official Ashley Lebinsky on Facebook. And then I would say I have a Twitter, but I don't actually use it. So it's not worth your time. But if you go to Instagram, it's probably the easiest way. Just send me a DM um, or you can go straight to my email on there and I'm happy to help. Awesome. We'll get you some more business drummed up. Oh, it's getting a little crazy as it is right now, but I'm always happy to hear more. <laughs> I can imagine. Well, we always like hearing from you and seeing what you're up to. And so um, I just want to tell you, thank you for coming on the show and spending two hours of your evening and starving your husband to death in the other room. I didn't even finish my one glass of wine. I feel like I have failed myself. Well, you're going to have to finish it. I'll work on it. Put Mark some dinner. <laughs> Before or after I finish the wine. Uh, I don't know. It depends on your mood. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, do you know how to cook without drinking one? Because I don't. Oh yeah, I, I I don't actually drink that often. It's a Facebook and social media illusion because I have been brand ambassador for whiskey and different things. But yeah, I don't actually drink that much. Um, and I but I put booze in my food all the time. Oh, there we go. You can just pour a little of the wine and the food as you're cooking. The Galloping Gourmet. It's a great old mm. cooking show. Oh. Well, we appreciate everything that you're doing for the gun industry and, you know, just advocating for rights and educating, really. I feel like what you're doing is almost educating more than anything and then letting the legislators make educated decisions instead of, you know, just blind ones. So thank you so much for everything that you're doing. Keep up the good work and thanks for coming on the show. And that'll be a wrap for episode 339.